Nasi, Nasi EFF, um, when we go to our communities, Siyo Bakalela go section three, where economic emancipation, Sisi Kapayana, Abuze Indobana, Nunani EFF, Nisi Kalela, and the economic season. It's the economic season. Nunani EFF, Nenda, Doninga Lot, Air Bukati. So now, Abantu di Singbamna is in the Sino Zenza, Tina Silulundu, from a branch level, RCT, to the upper structure. We need Indobana, Sipu, Messiago stakeholders. Try and find Le Indres Abasondes are closer to the economic, economic freedom through education. Um, we have young people who have been registered we hire institutions of learning, but Ababi Abagwa Zutai. Now Lamdan Shelloshin Abakwanzi Kunzaki. Now through educational programs, that team, Nasin EFM, Sipuma, Sio Abuja Nasin send some of these membership to to the SG's office. They come back as not registered to vote or those limitations in terms of their ID numbers. So how then do we uh, marry that uh, with our membership system? Number two, it's on section 14, which speaks of the CCT, uh, in particular subsection three, uh, where it speaks with the sec Secretary General. And I think you had emphasized, Commissar, that uh, when you're speaking of these portfolios, you are marrying them to RCTs and PCTs. 
So there in subsection 3A, it says, the Secretary General shall be a full-time official of the EFF based at its headquarters. So I, I am really on this one, I'm looking in terms of the regions, in particular the regional secretaries, where I think, Commissar, we, we really need to look into this, where the regional secretaries need to be full-time in the office, because there are most majority of them are also deployed as councillors in municipalities, and they are not coping with the work of the organization. Uh, Sir, every time that lady is on the on the thing, you mess up the sound. Yeah, please bring the guy who got it right. Yeah, you have, you have, please just get the person who got it right last time. Okay, Chief? Yeah, I'm repeating a bit. So I'm saying, yeah. if, if we can just look at um, emphasizing this point, especially with the regional secretaries, that they can be full-time in the office so that they can be able to execute the work of the organization that is required of them. And then lastly, on the code of conduct, uh, that point number seven, I just want to check in terms of, we got a lot of people who go on Facebook and they write things about the organization and they claim which is their personal accounts and all of that. I don't think we've emphasized the point where we say uh, anyone who, who speaks ill of the organization uh, defines themselves outside of the organization. So since in RCTs we don't have PDCs, if someone commits such an offense, what then do I as an individual, where do, do I report them, or how then does the organization enforce that those who write ill about the organization on social media face uh, the consequences? Thank you, Commissar. Number two of the ladies. I think it's here. She's uh, forgotten. Greetings, Commissar and ODP. Oteta yong no man nganga go disuga a Eastern Cape a Christiane region. Before I ask my question in a comment, we've been quiet because we are trying to grasp everything that you guys are trying to teach us, not because we are not cooperating with anything. And my question was about And you had a conference to resolve that. That's why we are quiet. <laughs> no. That's fine. I thought maybe there was a meeting where you agreed that this is the reason why you are quiet. No, no, TP. No, Commissar, sorry. And my question was about mm -hmm. the Constitution, Subsection 7, when the membership, yeah. in, in membership, it, but when we learned to try to register them on IEC, so we want to know what can we do about that. Thank you. Thank you. Number two of the main somebody yes are you trying to trick me mm -hmm. are you number two you are number three who's number two please stand yes 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 that t-shirt hurts my eyes but it's okay <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner. Yes, sir. My name is Gather Rezang, uh, RCT member, uh, JTG from Northern Cape. Um, I'm speaking under um, correction um, based on the issue of uh, our fellow African brothers. Uh, of which I think they are compromising us by misbehaving, for an example, for them to be implicated on the wrong things according to the belief of our fellow South Africans. Uh, let me just make an example, Commissioner, so that you should understand my, my point of view. Like uh, manufacturing wrong goods and drugs. And um, my issue here is how are we going to 
resolve this SEFF so that people should have a, a better understanding on why we said Africa for one, and we believe on that uh, emotion. And the other thing is that uh, uh, the issue of education, which is also very, very good, but um, our people misunderstand it in a way that uh, they, un they understand it wrongly by saying EFF is for the edu educated people only. In other words, the masses also is affected on the ground that if you are not educated, you do not belong to us. So it's, a, it's something which I need a clarity on it so that at least when I go back home, I should have a better explanation. Thank you very much. Thank you. So let's go to the next. Uh, uh, yes, they up there. Thank you, Commissioner, and good afternoon to everyone. My name is Ntabi Seng Chibenga. I'm an RCT member of the region of Ekurulen. Um, my question, um, Commissioner, I, I did not attend the, the meeting where we resolved. <laughs> so, but I, uh, the question would not necessarily be uh, uh, based on, on what was presented, but just to understand what we need to do in the situation of what committee. Uh, the first thing is to request that there must be uh, regulations on what committee, especially those that are voted in under the umbrella of the EFF, uh, but also to seek clarity of the accountability of what committee members um, that are elected under the umbrella of the EFF. Where do they report to? Do they report to the BCTs, uh, similarly to caucuses of the EFF that um, will then be led by your RCTs or, P or PCT. And my second one, uh, Commissar, will be on the issue of the media and communication to ask uh, how do we regulate the issue of uh, media, especially in EFF um, events, and the issue of the media in space of governance. We know generally that there are media houses that we don't dare go to, but in the space of governance, how do we deal with that issue? Thank you. Thank you very much. At the last hand, uh, some gentleman who is the last one. Are you sure I appointed you? Yes, indeed, I did. Affirmative. Uh, it's my chance. Uh, greetings, Commissar, and greetings to you, Deputy President. Uh, my question tonight is, after re uh, listening to the presentations uh, by Dr. Klozi, uh, Commissar Klozi, I really felt revitalized and feeling like I want to start off again and try again. But the question that I have tonight is that as an organization, along the organogram, we do have a problem of indicating right and turning left. Uh, most probably here are the two that were selected from each regions to be trained and officials from the provinces. But my question is, what are you doing to make sure that as you are training us, mostly we are going to train our juniors at a senior level, almost a senior level, that you also have certain seminars that we are talking to leaders to make sure that these teachings are actually practiced on the ground. Because what I have noticed is that uh, there is a lot of division on the ground based on blood and disregard for these regulations that are very clear. I would refer particularly to section nine, uh, item one, especially subsection F, which talks about to put the interest of the EFF above any other political consideration or personal ambition. 
All these have been explained very clearly to us, but we don't normally see it on the ground. So my question is, the training team, what is it going to do to make sure that this program is implementable in terms of teaching the people, as well as enforcing on us, the officials, our city regional secretaries, regional chairpersons, and all the leaders of the organization. Of course, I don't want this question to be misconstrued uh, to be a live testing environment. It means it is a hypothetical question that is based on things that we have sort of seen on the ground. Thank you, Commissars. Okay. I'm going to uh, quickly run through the questions and then invite the DP for Karl Marx. Agreed, DP? We don't, we're engaged in a struggle to allow our people to realize that in order to change the situation of unemployment, the situation of poverty, they must fight the system. There are no amount of entrepreneurial prob programs that are going to solve the problem of unemployment. They aren't. We've got to change. We have to take the fight to the system. What is this system? This system is the capitalist organization of development, access to the means of subsistence. We have to dismantle this in order for a new chapter in which poverty, unemployment, and inequality can be a thing of the past. This is really our duty. So don't overextend yourself and say, yeah, what are you doing? Are you giving us the jobs? No, we are in a revolution to say, we've got to organize our people to fight for the conditions, against the conditions that make us into a people that have to constantly be outside of the economic participation. This is the revolution, okay? Yes, if it's a non-South African and they are 16, they are not registered to vote, they can be an EFF member. Uh, if they are non-South African, they are not registered here in South Africa. I think uh, the membership system of the EFF DP uh, ma does make a provision that these are passport numbers. These are not ID numbers in a much more clear way. Uh, and I think maybe we can... Uh, improve on that if it is not clear. Regional secretaries, uh, the question of full-time secretariat is a basic, it's a question of resources, comrades. So when we do have the means, we do make secretaries across the country at the moment to be full-time in the regional office. They should. Where do you report offenses? You report offenses to the secretary. You write a complaint, you write to the regional secretary, and then the, 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 uh, the, the, the disciplinary procedure kicks in. You can register to vote, as far as I know, when you are 16 in the IEC. You can. You can't just vote but you can register to vote. So that, that shouldn't be a contradiction. We must disabuse ourselves from the idea that the wrong things of crime, like human trafficking, rape, murder, and so on, are done by foreign nationals, such that now we go around saying to foreign nationals, we're trying to fight for you, but you know you are raping. Uh -uh. That is a wrong approach to the question. Rape is wrong, it doesn't matter who engages in it. Whether you are Nigerian, Corsa, Pedi, man or woman, you must not rape. It ends there. You must not engage in human trafficking, you must not murder, and so on. When we're talking those issues, uh, do not make them the issues of foreign nationals. Then you will not resolve the problem. 
to know in Gauteng alone, between October and November of 2022, October and November of 2022 alone, in Gauteng only, how many medals, MMC? Over 7,500 people met that. That's about the space of two months. Medas. There is a problem in South Africa. It's not the problem of foreign nationals. It is a problem of running this country, of accountability, of the criminal justice system, but ultimately uh, of the worsening conditions under which Life is disregarded as useless. There's no respect for life. There are no consequences even to those who take life willy-nilly. The proliferation of shibins in society. Shibins are linked to violence. They are linked to murder. They are linked to high sexual violence occurrences. They are linked to a whole lot of ills, accidents, and so on and so forth. And as you know, one of the big institutions, particularly with regards to the townships, that needs to be taken into rigorous scrutiny in different parts of our legislative arms, DP, are the liquor boards. The liquor boards are giving every Tom Diggenary a, a, a liquor license. And some of these liquor licenses don't have conditions. They are next to schools. They're next to hospitals, they're next to churches. They open until 6 a.m. in the morning. They take alcohol to children, and they are not regulated. So you do not give more licenses than you can regulate. You ought to be able to be responsible like that. The question of the media, Comrade Speaker, is clarified by the President. Our non-interaction with the ENCA, which, is, which is, should always be understood as a, decision, as a decision they took. They took to not, they took a decision to walk out of covering the EFF. It has to do with us as a political party and them as a media station. But when we are acting on behalf of the responsibilities of government, the line of march is that at that instance, those are not EFF events. Those are not EFF meetings. Those are not EFF activities, comrade MMC of public safety. You ought to, to give the interview uh, and uh, listen to the, uh, the honorable journalist of the ENCA uh, and, uh, and speak to them. There's no problem. But when we're here, they are, they've taken a decision that uh, we're not, as an organization, to be covered by them. And they boycott our events. We don't invite them. They want to remedy that. They know what to do. We have always clarified that. Deputy President, it's time for Max. As a show of refreshment, let us stand and welcome the Deputy President to give us Karl Marx and Marxism. Let's encourage him with a big round of applause. Jenga Makabanas Miseluk Funda. Mandla. No, thank you very much, Commissar uh, Saying We are now going to talk about Karl Marx and Marxism. I'm going to try to be as brief as possible and, and cover the key components so that we do not overburden ourselves in terms of the extent and length and depth and width and width of information that we have to, to necessarily cover in this presentation. So we're going to just deal with the key issues which will be adequate for all of us to have some sense of introductory understanding of what Karl Marx stands for, what Marxism is, and what it represents. It's because we say as the EFF, we're the Marxist, Leninist, Fanunian 
organization. We're a movement that takes from Karl Marx that is inspired by Marxism. So the Marxism that informs and guides the EFF is derived out of the ideas of Karl Marx. So Marx, the same name, then it becomes Marxism. Those are the ideas that um, he is, regard, is regarded as many things. Some say he's a philosopher, some say he's an activist. He's a revolutionary in terms of what happens. But the most important thing that has been and is always the foundation of Marxism, something which Karl Marx said himself, is that philosophers have thus far only interpreted the world in various ways. But the point, however, is to change the world. So that is the essence of Marxism. So Marxism is the set of ideas that were developed by Karl Heinrich Marx, who then consolidated these ideas to say the ideas that should shape and inform and guide the working class in the struggle against capitalism with the aim of discontinuation of private ownership of the means of production and for the benefit of all. And with the growth and development of Marxism, it got to be enriched by many other Marxists. So Marxism is not just the texts that were written by Karl Marx. It includes the ideas that were written by many other contributors into the discourse of Marxism. So that includes Frederick Engels, who co-wrote the Communist Manifesto with Karl Marx. This includes the ideas of Vladimir Lenin, who got to give practice to what Marxism is. This includes the ideas of Leon Trotsky. It includes the contributions by Antonio Gramsci. It includes the ideas of America Cabral, Fidel Castro, Che Guevara, Kwame Nkrumah, Albert Einstein, Rosa Luxemburg, Mao Zedong, Deng Xiaoping, Xi Jinping, Franz Fanon, David Harvey, Ho Chi Minh, who is the father of the Vietnamese Revolution and the first general secretary of the Communist Party of Vietnam. So Marxism encapsulates all these perspectives that have got to shape the working class struggles in terms of uh, where they get to come from. So as we had said that this Karl Marx that we're talking about was born on the 5th of May, 1818, the year 1818, in a small town called Trier in Germany. And then he got to be educated in Germany for the longest uh, period of time. And part of his early reflections in terms of ideas, his contributions, was some, something called reflections of a young man. So you must look into what he got to write when he was at the age of 17. And then Karl Marx says that history calls those men the greatest who have enabled themselves by working for the common good. Experience acclaims as happy as the man who has made the greatest number of people happy. So you can see that even from early ages, when he was beginning to develop his ideas, he was already fighting for the common good, not just for individual self-gratification and individual self-enrichment. So Karl Marx says, history calls those men the greatest who have en enabled themselves by working for the common good. Experience claims as happy as the man who has made the greatest number of people happy. So that is the essence and the foundational ideas of who Karl Marx is. And over the years, like the ideas that Karl Marx stands for, they got to be understood as scientific socialism. 
scientific socialism, so the ideas of Karl Marx, they constitute the science that should guide all revolutionary parties in terms of how they seek to change society. And science in this context refers to knowledge that has been gained over time through thorough observation, has been critically tested, proven, and found to be true beyond any reasonable doubt. Are we together fighters? So science, when we say that this is the science, that is the scientific ideas of what the and of what Marxism is. And Karl Marx himself, he says that although I've got compassion and love for the working class, it is not my compassion and love for the working class that made me to come with the theories of historical materialism, of dialectical materialism, of recognition of the class struggle. He says that it is through the proper study of history of the political economy that we got to reach these conclusions that we have had seen the development of society over time. And then he says that any rational person who objectively studies history and the political economy will reach the same conclusions as I've reached in terms of what happens. And he challenges the world that if you are a rational person who is not driven by self-prejudices and self-interest and capitalist narrow interest, you will reach the same conclusion. So what he was basically saying was that Marxism and the ideas of scientific socialism are logically superior. So when something is logically superior is that whatever you do, it's just basic logic. So you know, Ngungiwa Tiongo, one of the greatest writers from Kenya, used to explain logic in a different way. He would say that he find people using these limbs, their hands, to walk, and they're, fa they're facing serious difficulties. Every time they try to walk with these limbs, their hands, and then when you, you tell them logic that, no, these limbs are not for walking. You must use these limbs, the legs. It's logic. To say the limbs for walking are these ones, not these ones. It's like the obvious things that is there. And that is what Karl Marx then says that his sci social scientific and views fall within that category of uh, what gets to be understood as the theory that should guide all uh, revolutions that seek to achieve socialism as a transition phase towards communism. So that is what got to happen. And the biggest contribution and the discovery of Karl Marx is something called historical materialism, which basically says that the society that we're living in has come from different stages of development, that we came from the era of primitive communism, where people were living primitively, and the resources were more or less shared equitably amongst those that lived in our communities. And then from primitive communism, it went to number two, to slave society. So it's primitive communism, a slave society, then it went to feudalism, where there was now beginning to be emergence of landowners who were employing some of the people who were involved in the harvesting of nature for subsistence, harvesting of nature for guaranteeing just the basic necessities that are required in society. And then from feudalism, then emerged capitalism. Capitalism was then to say this is the emergence of huge industries and owners of huge plots of land, of banks, of systems. And under capitalism, then you had contradiction of the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. Then socialism then becomes the next phase. And, and, and socialism is not just a natural progression. 
even these historical materials in that Karl Marx speaks about, it did that, it not just happen naturally. So what happened is that the slave society got to destroy the primitive communist society. And feudalism got to destroy the slave society. And capitalism destroyed feudalism. And then, then Marxism then becomes the theory which we utilize to mobilize society to defeat, to defeat capitalism. And capitalism and it has to be defeated through a socialist struggle. But then this socialism becomes a transitional phase towards communism. Are we together fighters? And then that this socialist society is nothing but a transitional phase that must be led by the working class. And in terms of system of what happens, it must be dictatorship of the proletariat. Komisambu is is correct that dictatorship of the proletariat, because the proletariat, the working class, those who do not own the means of production are always a majority in each and every society. So that is true democracy, where resources are primarily dictated upon and allocated by the majority, where all of us are given access to all the basic uh, necessities in terms of uh, what uh, gets to, to happen. So there have been so many characterizations of what socialism is. And in the socialist transition, so after you destroy capitalism through a socialist struggle, you have the dictatorship of the majority over the entirety of society. You have true democracy. But you do not just leave it there. You then develop the productive forces. Development of the productive forces means that you must build more industries. You must enhance and harness technology to help the people. You must have an economy that is far much more bigger and superior than it was under capitalism. Are we together fighters? And Karl Marx and Frederick Engels in the Communist Manifesto argued that under a socialist government, the development of the productive forces becomes far much faster than under capitalism. And why is such the case? Is because you are developing the productive forces or you are growing the economy in a maybe narrow conceptualization of it. You are building industry not driven by the profit motive. You are developing the productive forces. You are, you are, you are building industries, building infrastructure, not because you are looking for profit. Because under capitalism, everything else is produced and is done for, with a profit motive. So the capitalists produce food not because people are hungry. They produce food because they want to make money out of it. The capitalists get to be involved in the provision of education, of health care, simply because they want to make money, not because they want to educate the people. The capitalists develop infrastructure because they want to make money for themselves, not because they want to make life easier for the people. The capitalists extract mineral resources, the gold, the platinum, the copper, and all the basic mineral resources because they want to make money for themselves, not because there is a need to utilize those for the benefit of all the people. That is why the crisis of capitalism becomes the crisis when they've overproduced those goods and there is underconsumption. So the crisis of capitalism is a crisis of overproduction and underconsumption because they've overproduced the goods and products that otherwise cannot make money for them. So in a socialist transition, you are able to develop the productive forces to develop industry far much faster 
than it happens under capitalism. The case of the People's Republic of China, the case of Vietnam, is a vivid illustration that socialism develops the productive forces far much faster than it will happen under capitalism. So all these dominant capitalist nations of the world, the United States, the Europe, European countries of Britain, Germany, France, the time period it took them to develop capitalism to the stage that is at now spans for centuries, for hundreds of years. But under a socialist People's Republic of China, in a space of 30 years, China was able to catch up with a lot of industrialized nations because it was done under a socialist transition. Are we together, fighters? So if ourselves we want to realize faster and much more rapid development, socialist development, we need to defeat capitalism in South Africa. We are not going to be able to catch up with the rest of the world in terms of the development of industry, abolishment, of unemployment if we do not uh, develop, if we do not have the socialist uh, transition in terms of what is required. So now, and, and to give a clearer context about the socialist transition is to say something which was said, uh, to quote something that was said by Deng Xiaoping one of the leaders of the Communist Party of China who got to give a clearer context of what socialism is. He then says that socialism is the primary stage of communism. Socialism is the primary stage of, communi of communism. And that at the advanced stage, the principle of each from from each according to his ability to each according to his needs will be applied. And then he says, Deng Xiaoping says, this calls for highly developed productive forces. So productive forces, I'm, I hope you understand this, is the entire economy, all economic resources that have to be developed. So when we, ourselves, if we want to talk about development of South Africa, we must say, we are going to develop the productive forces far much speedier, much more rapidly than it will happen under a, under a capitalist system. So Deir Jongping says that this calls, socialism calls for highly developed productive forces and an overwhelming abundance of material wealth. Therefore, the fundamental task for socialist stage is to develop the productive forces. The superiority of the socialist system is demonstrated in the final analysis by faster and greater development of those forces than under the capitalist system. And as they develop, the people's material and cultural life will constantly improve. And then Deng Xiaoping makes an observation about the Chinese Revolution that one of the mistakes and shortcomings at the founding of the People's Republic of China was the inability to pay detailed attention to the development of the productive forces. It says that socialism means the elimination of poverty. That socialism is not purism, it's not poverty. Socialism is not collective poverty, it's collective wealth. And its rapid development to then get to benefit everyone in, in terms of these issues. Another intervention that deals with socialism, which originally was conceptualized and clearly scientifically conceptualized by Karl Marx that I was talking about, is Kwame Nkrumah, a socialist pan-Africanist, the father of pan-Africanism, clearly in the African continent. Kwame Nkrumah says that socialism in Africa introduces a new social synthesis in which modern technology is reconciled with human values, in which the advanced technical society is realized without the staggering social malfunctions and deep schisms of capitalist industrial society. 
And it says, for true economic and social development cannot be promoted without the real socialization of productive and redistributive processes. That is what he says. And then he says that those people who, 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 up, who embrace that we, uh, we, we must unite the technological development with human society, that we must do so with the aim of empowering the people at the ultimate end. That is the emphasis that is given in terms of uh, what uh, is required. So that, 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 that the, the, the essence of the contributions of Karl Marx is on socialism, but also the other important contribution that Karl Marx got to give to society is the illustration that we are in a class struggle under a capitalist society. That we have got two antagonistic, two contending class forces. I think that is the essence of what we must get. So if, if, if you do not understand anything from this political workshop, the one thing that you must come out of here knowing and clearly understanding is that we are in a class struggle. And we represent the working class ourselves. We are fighting against the capitalist class. Are we together fighters? And our obligation as political education officers is to raise the levels of class consciousness amongst the entirety of society. Is to defeat false consciousness. Is to make the people aware that Primarily, we are part of the working class, and our problems are associated with uh, the existence of capitalism. So that is the essence of uh, what uh, happens. And, and you know, Chris Hani, Chris Tembisile, Martin Hani, spoke about socialism, and when he was talking about it, we were giving it the context in South Africa, he says, socialism is not about big concepts and heavy theory. Socialism is about decent shelter for those who are homeless. It is about water for those who do not have safe drinking water. It is about health care. It is about the life of dignity for the old. It is about overcoming the huge divide between urban and rural areas. It is about a decent education for all our people. Socialism is about rolling back the tyranny of the market. And it says, as long as the economy is dominated by an unelected privileged few, the case for socialism will always exist. And it's Chris only giving it context that when we say we are fighting for a socialist society, it's about, it's, it's about protecting the dignity of humanity. It's about making sure that people have got access to all the basic necessities that got to uh, inform and, 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 and guide everyone. And do you know at foundational stages, the July 26 movement in Cuba was not overtly a socialist revolution when the overthrow of Batista took place. But the Cuban revolutionaries got to embrace Marxism and appreciate that this is the only way we can develop our economy, we can develop the productive forces, and give all the basic necessities to our people. As a result, Cuba got to eliminate, to abolish illiteracy. So gave education to everyone, free education to everyone, at even at, uh, at higher education level. Cuba is relative, it's a small country, it has got 11, 12 million people, but it has got 11 medical schools which trains thousands of doctors, not only for Cubans, but for the entire world. And this is a revolution that is led and guided by Marxism that we are talking about here. Fidel Castro says that from Marx, I received the concept of what, you, what human society is. Otherwise, someone who hasn't read about it or to whom it hasn't been explained 
It's as though they were set down in the middle of a forest at night without knowing which way north is, or south, east, or west. He says, Marx told us what a society is and the history of its evolution. Without Marx, you can't formulate any argument that leads to a reasonable interpretation of historical events, what the tendencies are, the probable evolution of a humanity that has not yet completed its social evolution. So without proper application of Marxism, a lot of things will confuse you in terms of what happens in society. So that, why, that is why Marxism becomes our tools of analysis and guide to action. And you'll be shocked, fighters, about something which I'm going to talk to you about now. So Nelson Mandela, before he sold out the struggles of black people in South Africa, in the long walk to, to freedom, in the authorized biography of Nelson Mandela, he says that I ascribe to Marx's basic dictum, which has the simplicity and generosity of the golden rule, from each according to his ability to each according to his needs. And he says that dialectical materialism seemed to offer both a searchlight illuminating the dark night of racial oppression and a tool that could be used to end it. That is what the Long Walk to Freedom says. He says, actually, in the Long Walk to Freedom, Nelson Mandela, the celebrated Nelson Mandela, he says, Marxism's call to revolutionary action was music to my ears as a freedom fighter. The idea that history progresses through struggle and that change occurs in revolutionary jams was similarly appealing. He says, in my reading of Marxist works, I found a great deal of information that bore on the types of problems that face a practical politician. Marxists gave serious attention to national liberation movements, and the Soviet Union in particular supported the national struggles of many colonial peoples. This was another reason why I amended my view of communists and accepted the position of the ANC in welcoming Marxists into its ranks. That is in the long walk to freedom by Nelson Mandela. There is no significant and worth noting political leader who didn't get to appreciate the relevance and significance of Marxism, which teaches us historical materialism, which is to basically say that society moved from primitive communism to slave society, to feudalism, to capitalism, and then we as Marxists must then utilize the Marxist, proper application of Marxism to defeat capitalism, to have this socialist transition towards communism. I want to deal with that in a, in a clearer way that under a socialist transition, you do not, when you defeat capitalism, Stand on a podium and then you say, from tomorrow, everything else is under collective ownership. There's a transitional phase where you necessarily must develop the productive process. Are we together, fighters? So there will still be some pockets of owners of the means of production there and there. But you decisively start the process of the transition towards communism. And in that transitional phase, you are still going to have the state. You are still going to have the state which is going to be acting on behalf of the majority. Which is going to be an instrument in the hands of the majority. Because the state, this institution of the state, which is government, the military, the police, and all its manifestations, including parliament, it's often used, it's always used as an instrument of class oppression. So whichever class is in domination utilizes the state to protect its interest. So under a capitalist society like we are living in now, 
The current state is an instrument of capitalist class rule. That is why when we say as the EFF who must have a national shutdown, the might of the state is brought to intimidate all of us. That is why when workers in Marikana are fighting with the bourgeoisie, demanding better wages from the bourgeoisie, the owners of the mines there, the state goes there not to mediate for a proper solution. The state goes there with its military coercive power to suppress the workers through killing them. In many instances, they even get to disrupt, use tear gas to disrupt workers who are in constant contradiction and antagonisms with their capitalist bosses. So when we have got a socialist transition, we are still going to have the state which is going to primarily act for the majority. And as time progresses, the development of the productive forces has been fully realized. And there has been complete discontinuation of private ownership of the means of production then the state will begin to wither away. And once it begins to wither away, that is when you know that we are in a communist society. So socialism is a transitional phase. And it's not time. It's not like to say we are going to have a socialist transition in five years. After five years, we are going to have a communist society. The Communist Party of China says that this socialist transition phase that they are in now is going to last for 100 years for the full development of the productive forces so that everyone else gets to benefit. And when we say that we are going to abolish the ownership of the means of production by private individuals, under a socialist society. It does not mean that you are going to abolish the ownership of personal non-exploitative property. Are we together, fighters? It doesn't mean that when you pack, so people will bastardize what socialism is. They say, no, under socialism, if you park your car here and you leave, you enter Emperor's Palace, when you come out, someone would have taken the car and proceeded to the different destination. That is not the case. And this, by the way, is dealt with even in the Communist Manifesto. That we are not about the abolishment of personal non-exploitative -pro non -non pro property. The, the ultimate aim is the abolishment of uh, private property that gets to exploit uh, other people out of the fruits of of their of their of their labor so that 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 is the essence of what marxism is it's, a, it's our guide to action is the ideas that gets to guide all of us and we we should appreciate one thing that is very important that Marxism is also not a dogma. It's not like a, a recipe. Like, you know, that those who are involved in, in cooking. It's not like, no, now we're faced with this situation. Let us go and check. What does Marxism say? We must mix this and that. Then we will solve a problem. No. It, it's Marxism is, must be dynamically applied in all conditions. But the consistency of applying Marxism in analyzing each and every condition is what are the interests of the working class, of the class that we represent and we serve at all times. Are we together, fighters? That is why we say, like, all the time to public representatives everywhere in the municipalities, in the legislature, in the national parliament, Whatever is brought there, whatever law is brought there, whatever budget is brought there, you must ask what class interest is this legislation, is this budget going to serve? 
What are the class interests that we're going to drive out of this project? So you see, ourselves, we know that the crisis in ESCOM is created so that they can serve the interest of the bourgeoisie. They create a crisis and then they end up coming to us and say, let us disengage the state from generation of electricity. You know, Godongwani goes as a minister of finance to say we are going to give ESCOM a bailout of 260 billion rands. That is more than budgets of many countries in the African continent. So we're going to give ESCOM a bailout of 260 billion rands on condition that ESCOM must not be involved in the generation of electricity. So a proper class analysis of that budget allocation will reveal to you that they want to create space for energy generation to be done by the bourgeoisie. By the capitalists, they want to introduce these independent power producers. They want to close down the generation capacity of ESCOM so that private capitalists can be the ones who generate electricity and make profits out of it. Out together, fighters. But if we are not class conscious as the EFF, once they said 260 billion is going to be given to ESCOM, we're going to say, yeah, at least the state is doing something. No, the state is intervening. We are happy with this intervention. ESCOM is going to at least have some space to breathe. It will bring us electricity. So whatever agenda that is served, even in your own municipalities, you must be able to give a class analysis of each and every intervention that is being made there. That is why we say as the EFF, the Governance Task Unit, that all municipalities of the EFF, all public representatives of the EFF, must introduce motions on insourcing of workers, on building state capacity, of building internal capacity. We give a directive in that regard because primarily we are guided by this Marxism that says that we should, all of us, uh, get to empower ourselves and empower the working class primarily in everything else that we get to do. There is no, it's not, I'm sure, this is not difficult for us, is it? It's, it's as simple as that. That Marxism is a theory that is being utilized by a revolutionary party, a revolutionary movement, a revolutionary economic emancipation movement to liberate the whole of society. We can't just rely on common sense to resolve our immediate challenges. Part of what is going to keep the organization to live forever and consistently it's its constant application of Marxism. I can tell you now that if we had just gone to the National Assembly on what is to be done and said we are forming a political organization without any ideology, without any guide to action, without any tools of analysis, we are going to deal with problems as and when they come. We are going to be dead by now. Because we're going to do different things in different corners of South Africa. We're going to be disintegrated. So there is a common thread that is primarily Marxism that gets to guide all of us. And Marxism is what got to inspire and guide the greatest socialist October revolution that took place in Russia in 1917. And in the same way we're talking about China, Russia, after the socialist revolution, got to develop its productive forces in a faster and rapid way. Developed industry and engaged in scientific research in a far much more superior way 
than it could have ever happened under a feudal or semi-feudal society that characterize what Russia was. And I and 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 the there is often misreading so of under what conditions do you agitate for socialist transition? So there are people who sometimes think that you must wait for capitalism to be fully matured for you to destroy capitalism. That is not the case, by the way. So you must check the so after the publishing of the Communist Manifesto in 1848. Almost every three or four years, whenever new editions of the Communist Manifesto will be released, Karl Marx and Frederick Engels will always write new prefaces to say, this Communist Manifesto is still relevant. It's one of the prefaces that acknowledges that you do not have to wait for capitalism to fully develop before you agitate for socialist transition. And that was born out of practical observations of the struggles of the people. To say that you can advocate for socialist transition even in a, That is why Vladimir Lenin could lead a socialist revolution in what was not a fully developed capitalist Russia. Are we together, fighters? So ourselves, we should agitate for that particular socialist transition under uh, those uh, uh, different uh, components. I would be abusive uh, if I go further, Commissar Buisen. Let's take questions. Thank you very much. <laughs> Right, uh, number one at the back. We'll take one round. Uh, it will be number two, Sissy. Uh, it will be number three. Yeah, this thing of me taking hands is very difficult. It's the most difficult task in this entire palaver because of the obvious masculinity in the rooms <laughs> over masculinization. Uh, those things we like saying at the university. <laughs> Toxic masculinity. Uh, uh, so I don't see and I'm appealing comrades uh, to save us. All right, let's start afresh. Uban number one is there at the back. Uban number two, you are CC number two. Number three, Nguwe. Number four, CC. Number five, is there here, Kokezo. And then number six, CC. Woki, Beze, Lumtu. Number seven, Nangwe. I think that balances it. Let's hear. Let's see how it goes. Yeah, if they ask short enough questions, you know, I'll, I'll take a second round. Number one, GP, uh, you are ready? You are fine? Excellent. Uh, shoot. All right, uh, greetings, Commissar, uh, and to the Deputy President, Mudiba Mudiba here from the Inside Fact. Uh, as, as, as a person in media, I'm trying to understand the Marxist approach in, 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 in media. Um, and I want to find out if I would be correct to say, um, my question would be like, as media practitioners, would I be correct to say that in our reporting, especially as black journalists or as black investigative journalists, that our reporting at all material times should reflect a Marxist approach to say that before I release this story, in what interest does it play into the class consciousness? And I ask this because when we try to do this in South Africa, we are termed as being EFF journalists or RET journalists or all sorts of journalists. But then when you interact with journalists in Russia at RT, they tell you at all material times that there are certain stories which they don't take out because it does not play into the national consciousness of, of the Russian people. So my question would be that would it, would it be correct to say that as media practitioners, especially as black journalists, 
that it all material times our reporting or before we release a certain story, we also have to have this um, analysis of Marx to say that in what interest is it going to play into the class consciousness? Thank you. Thank you. This is our guest with a very decisive question. Man number two. Yeah. Something case at him. Yes. Uh, um, yeah, I, I, let me check. Case at hand, people raise your hands. Oh. I was worried that all of you seem like you are from the student command. Oh, okay. Except you. You, I, I know you. But uh, I'm going to be looking out for such things. <laughs> all right. Don't let that disrupt you. Uh, over to you, Sissi. Um, Gabonga, eh, Komisa, once again, greeting fighters. Umbuzo Amje, Umanega Kul, Komisa, Uguti. Um, looking at the understanding of Marxism and socialism, it's all about uh, collective liberation of people, sharing wealth and everything. And then when it comes to Ama African ethics, or rather, Ama African um, principle, we have the ethics called Ubuntu. Then now, there is a question, no matter there is a debate, even about Bali, about we articulate so good. Is there a difference between Ubuntu as an African ethics and socialism as an uh, tools of analysis? Because Ubuntu teaches us to value collective um, uh, development of people rather than individualism is fundisa to always be kind to one another sharing even with our culture e culture it's as black people yes fundis must stand on so will i be correct if i were to say maybe ubuntu is an african socialism or there is a difference because seemingly e e e marxism or e socialism focus cool with class whereas ubuntu it touches like almost everything, even J in Pingela is pilang also. In Elubuz, I mean what is there different no masingashwood socialism is Ubuntu in an African context. Thank you. Number three. Yeah. What's the wap? Uh yes. Uh all protocol observed. Uh this is Naito from Epondweni, uh our Tambo region. Uh, I'm a Ponduin. <laughs> uh, is it the horn? Or yes. No, the horn. The horn. Yeah, we're all Imagine. in the horn. <laughs> um, yes. Since um, we've had the presentation, the love representation on Karl Marx and um, the whole socialism, would it be correct to say that? in us taking the first step towards socialism would be trying to revive the abandoned um, firms or factories. For example, we have more than 20 uh, uh, um, factories in Butterworth alone in Eastern Cape uh, that are, are serving as uh, white elephants that were there in the times of um, 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 Matanzim. And then at the same time we have some abandoned uh, firms which are about the same number in King Williamstown in Eastern Cape. Um, because back in the days, uh, if we remember that uh, Eastern Cape doesn't have much minerals, uh, more especially the side of uh, the former Transkei. So those uh, factories used to serve as means of trying to generate income into people's homes. Because we used to have a Mahrotman that were employed. Uh, that Don't be tempted to give an address. Okay, okay let me. <laughs> 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 um, so my, so my, 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 my first question, and then the last, my first question was, would be, would it be correct to say the first step would be reviving the abundant uh, factories and yes. firms that um, are serving as white elephants? Mm -hmm. And then um, there's the issue of educating uh, the masses outside of formal education, meaning outside of schools, political parties, because 
I have researched that China, basically TikTok, for example, the algorithm in TikTok there that is used there, when you enter into TikTok, already things that are uploaded on TikTok are how to uh, manufacture a radio, how to do this, how to do that. Um, would it also be proper to say that we need to start um, embarking on ideas like those uh, that we actually distribute amongst fighters uh, and say that um, we need to share skills in terms of that. Thank you. Okay, if you're number three, then there should be a number four. Number four. Number four. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, Commissar. Yes, sir. Uh, firstly, let me start by appreciating uh, this effort by the CCT to come and induct us in this uh, session. Uh, my question, Commissar, relates to the comment you made earlier about Marxism being a very universal uh, philosophy. Uh, and I want to, you know, draw inspiration from the fact that our literature's EFF gives the assertion that our problems began in 1652 with the arrival of Jan van Riebeck. And when we are hearing here, the Communist Manifesto, I think, is from 1884. So there was a, a, a concern which was raised about what is the primary contra contradiction according to our characterization as the EFF. I'm also reading here in the branch induction manual a section which says, both Marx and Lenin, however, did not appreciate that the emergence of capitalism systematized anti-black racism as its fundamental motive. Above the colonial conquest of non-European societies to expand markets was an equally powerful and explo exploitative project of capitalist industrialization that made Africans into perpetual non-humans. Now, the time that Marx was writing already our problems had begun. And uh, can we really say that there was a deeper studying or observation into the peculiarities of what was happening in Africa? And can we really say that our struggle was informed by the need for the capitalist class to try and chase profit rather than their deep hatred for the black skin and their deeply rooted sentiments of white superiority and black uh, inferiority. I think, yeah, that's my question, Commissar. Thank you. Uh, number five. All protocol observed. My name is Riala Boha Mahiledise from the Free State Mangaung region. Mine is just a clarity seeking question because, as we know, Karl Marx is a communist that states that socialism is um, a transitional phase to communism. In that sense, as the EFF, we believe in Karl Marx teachings. Do we, at some point as the EFF, want to reach communism, or are we staying in the transitional phase that Karl Marx has stated? Thank you. Right. You are number five. There should be a number six and the last. There is a mic next to number six. Thank you, Commissar. Um, I just want to request clarity from the sh leadership with regards with regards to uh, the issue of uh, false consciousness that we see uh, mainly from your ANC people when we ask that uh, what is the reason um, they can't take the country to so socialism when they think so much about it. And the common response to that would be, we've had apartheid for over 300 years, so the 30 years that they've had, um, it's, it's little time. We would then want to respond by saying, but in 1994, when you came in, uh, Rwanda had uh, genocide uh, uh, just beginning and look at it now. So I want to check that in, in quoting Rwanda in this context, is, is it uh, in line with uh, the Marxist approach that 
the EFF uh, is teaching us? Uh, if not, is there a reasonable way to deal with this type of question? Then my second one, Commissar, would be uh, in terms of governance, um, looking at issues of class consciousness. We, we are usually pushed to pass pro-poor budgets, but at times not passing the pro-poor budget has dire consequences. Uh, is, is there a way on how to deal uh, with this issue uh, of, of budgets and, and embody Marxism there um, without it having um, 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 such um, uh, consequences? Because if budgets are not passed because we are saying they are not pro-poor, then it will mean the consequences of uh, Metro being uh, put under administration and such. Thank you. The president of the EFF. No, 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 it was that um, you could say Rwanda, South Africa had the same start year, 1994. But comparing South Africa and Rwanda, Rwanda is relatively in a much better developmental path than these ones. So the idea that between 1994 and now, is still early to have impact, does not pass. Am I correct? Excellent. I think I'm doing very well with listening here. Amanda. No, thank you very much, uh, fighters. I, I, and I, I think it's good that we, we become some, um, straight to the point so that we're able to deal with... Uh, all of these uh, issues. And I, I, I would think that uh, what Mudiba is saying, we should uh, encourage class conscious media and class conscious journalism as well, like, which is a way like, that th these are the struggles that we're in pursuit of. There is nothing neutral about media. Actually, there's nothing neutral in a class struggle. You can't be neutral in a class struggle. In a struggle between the capitalist and the working class, you can't be neutral. Even keeping quiet is taking a class position. It means you agree with the status quo. So there's nothing neutral about everything else that you do. You must always be aware that so they, there has to be class conscious media that should be supported and encouraged in different manifestations in terms of the shapes that they take and everything else. There, there are so many things that uh, you can see that this is just a class agenda that is being pursued by certain sections of the media. Almost the entirety of the mainstream media uh, gets to to take that route. But also one thing which you should look into as a, as political education officers and activists of the EFF, you should feed yourself of content that you want to consume. Really. Of course you must be aware of what is happening in society, but to sit behind the television every day and watching news and all of these things, not wise. You must choose, like there's so much content on YouTube which you can choose that I want to learn something about this issue. Like feed yourself, like, or not children. Don't be fed every time. Where you don't have any other perspective of, always look for a, a class biased perspective, like a working class biased perspective on every question. You must choose what you want to eat in terms of what you want to consume. You know, children don't have a choice. Like uh, when they're still babies, they're just given whatever parents have decided every time. And yourself, you subject yourself in terms of media consumption. And then you end up analyzing society like any other person because that is what they seek to achieve, by the way. That no, you must view the EFF in this way. You must even view your leaders with some sense of doubt because they always will push doubt in the leadership of the EFF. They put some people who are so-called analysts, then they are bashing, no, the EFF is misguided. This. 
you end up even getting scared yourself that hey, it looks like what you're doing is wrong. Because you are, you are just eating wrong things. You are consuming wrong things. So, so that is one of the things that we purposefully should do differently in terms of um, what happens. So do you know the, the other fighter speaks about Ubuntu and everything else? So the, do you know in the early stages of the liberation struggles and liberation of many African countries, and mostly in the 60s, there was a huge debate in the African continent on something which was being introduced as African socialism. So Kwame Nkrumah wrote a very interesting document, which you can gain access to. All of you have got access to the internet now. It was called African Socialism Revisited. So you must search for that. African Socialism Revisited. And Kwame Nkrumah was, because African socialism was mostly like, well, mostly the, like an illusionary imagination that the primitive African society was a classless society which was not oppressive to people, which is not true. It's not true that the primitive African society was the best of society. It was patriarchal in a huge way. It had no respect, none whatsoever, for females. And there, were, there, were, there, were, there was some sense of divisions of people who were just suppliers of labor, like perpetually, in a, in a feudal system. It's very difficult to say this, by the way, but even when slavery got to happen, the slaves were traded by African chiefs. They will take, they will identify in their own communities and say, no, these ones are going to sell to these white people who are passing by, by us here. So we, 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 we must, our, the socialism that we are in pursuit of is scientific socialism that is about moving forward. We're not going back. It's about the the development of the productive forces. So, Kwame Nkrumah says that socialism is about uniting humanity with the technical and te technological advancement that is happening in society. And then he calls this African socialism is some degree of nostalgia, like, but also a false understanding of what historically happened. So, so anthropologists get to reveal that, but don't... Uh, be misled to think that the society before this and we are moving forward. If we're in a historical materialist in environment, not we say we, are, we ascribe to historical materialism. It moved from primitive communist society to slave society to feudalism to capitalism. Socialism is the way forward. It's not the, it's not to go back. Even the values and morals that we're going to, as, to, as, to, as, to ascribe to are going to be socialist values and morality that guide all of us. So what we aim for is to move forward in terms of what we get to uh, represent. We must not be a nostalgic. So I think the other perspective that we're going to share is the so do you know what after apartheid created the Bantu stands purposefully and made them to the reserves of labor to go and fetch laborers and put them in townships when they are tired they go back and everything else there. They, at some stage they realized that it looks like there is too much influx of black people into areas which were designated as white people's areas. So as part of population control, these factories in the Bantu stands were initiated by the apartheid government as part of influx control. They were controlling the movement. They were saying that hey, these people, we have taken them to Bantu stands, but the factories are only in our white areas. 
And these people are coming in huge numbers. They are even outnumbering us in many other spaces now. So we are going to build them factories back there where they come from. That is why we have got those factories there in Sibasa, Chepesen, in Shandim. We have got in Shihua as well some factories. We have got in Bochabela there is some factories as well. In part of Batawathinum Tata, those were a mechanism and they were over subsidized by the apartheid government. So the people who were going to manufacture in those factories were even exempted from paying any tax. They were saying, no, just keep those people busy there. They are too many. They want to come to our spaces. Keep them busy there. And the model that they had adopted was not sustainable. The model that we are saying is sustainable is contained in the EFF's 2021 Local Government Elections Manifesto and the 2019 Elections Manifesto, where we speak about inward industrialization. So in those manifestos, we even go to the detail of just what must be produced in a labor-absorptive way in all parts of the South African economy. So there is a model for industrialization that we can pursue, not just to replicate what apartheid did. We must do it in a meaningful, impactful way that is going to develop the productive forces. That is what we say in the manifestos of the EFF. We can develop the productive forces, not in a nostalgic way, in a way that says we're moving forward, with an appreciation as well that there are so many technological changes that can be adapted into how new factories can get to uh, be uh, dealt with. So when we go towards a socialist transition phase, we are going to do everything else that socialist transition phase requires. We're going to redistribute the resources equitably. We're going to discontinue private ownership of the means of production. We're going to implement the seven cardinal pillars. So the seven cardinal pillars says that we must expropriate land without compensation for equal redistribution. That is what we're going to do. The seven cardinal pillars say that we must pursue massive protected industrial development to create millions of jobs. That is development of the productive forces. That happened under a socialist transition. That is what we are going to do maximally. And we will then begin to realize with time, once the productive forces have been developed, that the state will wither away in terms of uh, what happens. It's not correct that Rwanda has developed the speaker of Egorle. They they say Rwanda is not as developed as people are made to imagine. Even the numbers don't speak to that. There is too much friction that is obtaining there. And a lot of capitalist looters of the resources in the DRC often use Rwanda as a lending pedestal to enter into the Democratic Republic of Congo to destabilize it so that there is no legitimate government in the DRC so that they can take the cobalt, the gold, and many other essential natural resources out of the DRC without paying for any taxes. There are parts of sections in Rwanda and Kigali which are properly kept and clean and everything else. They do. But the, 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 the informality and the squalor is not very far even from Kigali. Like, like, I'm talking practical reality. And there, there are so many pitfalls that characterize Rwanda, a lot of them, which of course are covered or glossed over 
by these international conferences that take place there. I know I saw the FIFA conference was there last week. The IPU had a meeting in October last year. They're like a lot of but there are so many things which are not explained. We must talk about Rwanda every time. Check what the representatives of the Democratic Republic of Congo pe persistently say in the United Nations interventions and debates. Check what the DRC delegation says in the Pan-African Parliament, in the SADC Parliamentary Forum, in the Inter-Parliamentary Union as well. There is something which is highly concerning about the Rwandan government. And it's not true that it is fully developed in the manner that is imagined. There is too many fictional things that are going on uh, in that uh, particular country. So that is what the, I don't know the other questions, I've, I've covered all of them. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, we'll do. In terms of uh, all of these issues, yeah, we'll deal with all of these issues. That's what uh, Komizambu is saying. Okay. <laughs> yes. Um, what was it saying about China? No, we'll reserve the pre which is primary race or class, oh. the, the old uh, the old epistemic question. Uh, let us, if Commissar Tembi is with us, take a 15 minutes tea break and then we are going to take Lenin. Uh, so we'll come back at exactly quarter past five. Go and refresh Uzobuya, Uzomamelu, Vladimir, not Putin, Vladimir Lenin. Uh, and then uh, we take it from there. Merci beaucoup. Bye. 
God.